We now want to talk about the role and the revelation of the Blessed Virgin as it appears in the Gospel of John, really some exceptional passages, and also in other New Testament citations. Uh, I've been asked to mention, though, in this transition from last lecture to this lecture, that for those who are interested in a, in a summation of the truth of the Church regarding St. Joseph, uh, there is a new book all out called uh, Meet Your Spiritual Father. Uh, it is uh, a small book that I've done, uh, which is very conversational, very popular, which outlines uh, the truths about St. Joseph in Scripture, in tradition, in the magisterium, some of the greatest saints and mystics, uh, and even elements of authentic private revelation. Uh, if you are interested in uh, Meet Your Spiritual Father, you can get that book from uh, Lighthouse Catholic Ministry or from Marian Press. Uh, its companion book is called uh, Meet Your Mother, and it is a summation of the Church's teaching on the doctrine and devotion of our Blessed Virgin. Uh, it is also something that can be given to someone who has no Judeo-Christian background at all. Uh, it presupposes no understanding of church or dogma or doctrine. We'll we explain all those things in that book as well. It's also distributed uh, by both Catholic Lighthouse uh, Ministry, Lighthouse Catholic Ministry, and uh, Marian Press. So, meet your spiritual father uh, and meet your mother. Uh, one last, you'll forgive me, one last anecdote uh, about St. Joseph, which is actually uh, some, some of the sublime theology about him. St. Thomas Aquinas, and, and later accentuated and drawn out by the French theologian Bossuet, said that because of St. Joseph's humility, he wouldn't dare to command the Savior in exercising what would be his rightful authoritative role as a father. Of course, it's authority and service, authority and love, but it's still an authority. Joseph's humility wouldn't have him do that. Unless, as Thomas and, and Bosway will add, God the Father implanted part of his fatherly heart into the heart of St. Joseph so he could command Jesus in a way that would be appropriate for being a rightful head of the household. And they both, both theologians uh, add that God the Father also put into the heart of Jesus the grace and humility to see Joseph as an authentic father, uh, and of course, uh, which he was, not biological, but virginal, but also uh, with a proper obedience uh, and, and love. Uh, again, St. Joseph is the icon of God the Father. Uh, of course, Mary is more holy than uh, Joseph, we know that, but in terms of a male representing what St. Joseph, uh, excuse me, what, what God the Father is in terms of virtue and grace and uh, an authentic uh, masculinity and manhood, St. Joseph is your best. So, uh, again, the two books, Meet Your Spiritual Father and Meet Your Mother, both available by Lighthouse Catholic Ministry or by Marian Press. Now, let's go to the rich uh, Marian passages that we find in the Gospel of John. We start with John 2. 1 through 10, the wedding at Cana. And this is extraordinary, and we won't get into all of this here because we'll talk about this in rela relation to Our Lady's mediation. Uh, but I'm going to have to hold myself back because uh, this is such a profound passage. At the wedding of Cana, Mary intercedes for two events of grace. Number one, she clearly, directly intercedes for Jesus' first public miracle. That cannot be denied. Secondly, she intercedes for the very public ministry of Jesus Christ because it's her faith which makes it the right time for Jesus to perform the miracle of turning the water into wine at Cana and thus officially beginning Jesus' public ministry. Now, uh, a little bit more detail. Let, let's go through the dialogue between uh, Mary and Jesus. Mary comes to Jesus and says, they have no wine. Jesus responds, and, and, and we really want to get this accurate because although it is identical in the Greek, which would be the original language for the New Testament in this passage, and it's identical 
in the Latin, somehow we still get a variety of translations, some of which are not really true to the original text and sense of the text. So, what does Jesus respond back to Mary when she says they have no wine? He says, for example, in the Latin, mulier, quid mihi et tibi. Uh, what is this to me and to you, woman? The same thing in the Greek, ke emoi et toi, et soi. What to me and to you, woman? Let's talk about the woman first. When Jesus refers to Mary as woman, one might see that as derogatory. Uh, it's anything but. It's the opposite. It is Jesus identifying Mary as the woman of Scripture, the woman of Genesis. It's connecting Mary with the woman of Galatians, as we'll talk about shortly, the woman of Calvary, the woman of Revelation. So, it's not a derogatory term, it's a term of establishing that Mary is the woman with the God-man of redemption. So, first of all, that term woman is a dignified term. Secondly, let's, let's see it in terms of the context. And Fulton Sheen has a fantastic commentary which, which, which confirms the proper understanding of this. What to me and to you. That's what Jesus literally says. What to me and to you. Which means, what's the significance of this to us, to both of us? And Fulton Sheen will say beautifully that Jesus is saying to Mary, and again paraphrasing, look, if I do this miracle, this will let everyone know who I am and we will begin the public ministry and we will then have the fast track from Cana to Calvary. From Cana to Calvary. Are you ready for this? Now, why would Sheen say this? Because the word our. Jesus says after what to me and to you. And remember, the order doesn't matter in either the Greek or the Latin. Me to you or you to me. My woman. He then says, my hour has not yet come. Hour, in the Gospel of John, always refers to Calvary, to the climax, to the event of redemption. My hour has not yet come. So, as Sheen says, Jesus is saying, are you ready for this? Because if I do this miracle, we now start the road which we both know will end at Calvary, in untold suffering. Are you ready? How does Mary respond? Mary does not respond directly to Jesus. She responds with an act of faith to the attendants in her last words of Scripture. John 2, verse 5. Do whatever He tells you. And therefore, Mary's faith makes it the right time because God doesn't do anything out of the right time. He does everything in the appropriate time. But this was conditional on Mary's faith, as God willed. So, Mary gives the act of faith, and then Jesus performs the miracle. And indeed, you now have the public ministry of Jesus beginning. And, as St. John Paul II says repeatedly, Cana is fulfilled at Calvary. That's what takes place both symbolically at Cana uh, and physically at Calvary. This, this union of, of, of Jesus and Mary in the work of redemption. Now, it's very significant, uh, and I, let me just mention some of the translations that I think uh, perhaps fall short of what the Greek and the New Vulgate, the official uh, translation of the church, says. Sometimes it's translated, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Notice the, the adversative tone of that. What does your concern have to do with me? In other words, this is, this is very different than saying, what is this to us? What to me and to you? It's almost like, you know, why are you bothering me with your concern? I'm not sure how you can arrive at that type of translation based on the original text. It's a unified text. We could even say it's the Redeemer and Co-Redemptrix. The Redeemer is asking the Co-Redemptrix, 
are you ready to complete our work? Are we, are we ready to start what will end at Calvary? So it's a very much of a unified text. Uh, I will sometimes, you know, kid the students at Franciscan University of Steubenville, you know, if a parent came on a weekend and it was a weekend when the student's room was a disaster of, of clothes and, and undone laundry, and the student said, you know, let's go, let's go out, and let's say the mother said, well, we're not going anywhere till your room is clean. And let's say the student responded, you know, woman, what is this to you and to me? My, your, my hour has not yet come. Uh, well, that could be an offensive type of response. But in this context, you're talking about a woman identified as the woman of Scripture in virtue of their joint mission. And we know that it's pleasing to Jesus what Mary responds because Jesus then does it. On the contrary, as some uh, non-Catholic uh, commentators will say, no, this is a sign of, of, of sinfulness of Mary. Well, that's not only extraordinary, but it's, it, it's just plain wrong, uh, and, it, and it can't be justified because if Mary is sinning, which is a, a great stretch from the text to begin with, Jesus confirms the sin by doing exactly the sinful thing that Mary asks uh, and requests. Uh, can't be right. You have the opposite. You have a clear case of Mary directly interceding for a miracle of Jesus, and the Son does not deny the mother. As we heard from the Gebi Ra references in the Old Testament and, and Solomon's response to Bathsheba, I will deny you nothing. Okay? And Jesus denies Mary nothing. And Mary asks for nothing that is not pleasing to Jesus. So it's a beautiful complementarity. No competition, my friends. Unity. Unity for the self-same mission. So Cana is a clear biblical example of Mary's active intercession as the mediatrix of grace. Uh, and uh, parenthetically, I would say it's sometimes a very good place to start in terms of an apologetic or, or defensive treatment of the role of Mary to the non-Catholic Christian. And, and as we are less and less catechized, as we should, by, should be sometimes, this is also important for the Catholic who is uncatechized. Um, this, is, this is a clear reference of this universe, this intercession. And, John Paul II, St. John Paul II will say some beautiful things about this, how, how Mary is the spokeswoman for her son's will, how Mary acts as a mediatrix, not as an outsider, but in her role as mother, and she has the right to do so. That's from Redemptoris Mater, and we'll talk about these texts later. Let's now go to John, John 19, 26, uh, or 25 through 27. The great dialogue before Jesus has finished the work of redemption. And in fact, it's significant that this happens at the end of the work of redemption, the last moments of Jesus on the cross. What does he give? At the price of this suffering, he gives us the gift of his mother, to be our mother. So the dialogue Jesus speaks to Mary, woman, remember that woman again, woman, behold your son, that same woman connecting Mary as the woman of Cana, but also prophesied in Genesis, fulfilled in Revelation, uh, and mentioned also uh, as a confirmation of the early church in, in Galatians. Woman, behold your son, in reference to John. Now, John, in the constant mind of the church, represents two bodies of people. First of all, John rep represents all beloved disciples. Secondly, John represents all humanity. Why? Why does John represent all humanity? Because the redemption is a universal event. It's an event which affects all humanity. Even for those who don't tap the graces of the redemption, their sins were, their, their sins were in the order of the reparation. Jesus paid the price for their sins, even if they sadly don't choose to accept that grace through a, a misuse of their free will. So it's a universal event. And John represents all, uh, both disciples and all humanity in general. And then Jesus says to John what he says to each one of us, Behold your mother. This, my friends, is not an invitation. It's a statement of theological fact. And as St. John Paul II says, it's a personal gift from Jesus to you and to me. We don't want to refuse personal gifts of Jesus. We, 
We shouldn't refuse personal gifts from Jesus. In a certain sense, we can't afford to receive personal gifts, to, to refuse personal gifts uh, that Jesus gives us because they're given to us for a reason, for our salvation, for our sanctification. And Mary is too. She's given to us for this key supernatural region, reason that God wants us to have a mother in the process of working out our salvation. So, Mary says, excuse me, Jesus says to John, Behold your mother. In that event, as we'll go back to several times in terms of spiritual maternity and, and, and maternal mediation, in that event, Jesus gives the world his mother to be our mother in the order of grace, as Lumen Gentium number 61 says at the Council. It's a beautiful text. Now, it's obviously a price, uh, it, it's a gift of great price, both for Jesus and Mary. St. John Paul II will once again say that at Calvary, Mary is spiritually crucified with her crucified son, but that her role as co-redemptrix did not cease with the glorification of his son. His 1985 address in, in Guayaquil in Ecuador. What does that mean? Well, we're going to talk about that, how she's spiritually crucified, but her role as co-redemptrix, and that's an explicit reference that St. John Paul II makes as Pope. Her role as co-redemptrix did not cease with the glorification of her son. We'll explore that later. Uh, and here, I think, first and foremost, we have to say that every Christian, everyone who sees himself as a disciple of Jesus is called to imitate John. What does John do? He takes Mary into his home, Scripture says. And in fact, in, in the Greek, it's into his own, not just a geographical house, but into his heart, into his possession. Every Christian is called to take Mary into their heart, into their possession, into their own, their spiritual interior life, as St. John Paul II will say in Redemptoris Mater. Much more on Calvary and Mary's role uh, in our later lectures. Let's go to the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, Acts 1.14, it's significant that Mary is present in the upper room. St. John Paul II will add that Mary's prayers in a special way call down the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Why? Because they have a spousal relationship. Sometimes when one spouse is talking at one side of the room, the other spouse can recognize her voice on the entire opposite side of the room. Uh, spouses have that intimacy. So beyond all the other prayers, the Holy Spirit's going to hear Mary's prayers for his descent at Pentecost as she's there in the upper room. St. Maximilian Kolbe uh, will say beautiful things about this, which we'll explore in later lectures. Essentially that the Holy Spirit, not through necessity, but through divine disposition, acts only through Mary, his human spouse. And that's why Mary is the mediatrix of each and every grace of the Holy Spirit. Much more on that beauty and profundity. We go to Galatians, Galatians 4.4, 4, St. Paul's explicit reference to Our Lady. In the fullness of time, God sent his Son, born of a woman. Galatians 4, 4 to 4, 6 is two beautiful verses because you go from God the Father to Jesus, Mary, adopted children, the Holy Spirit, who then says what? Calls us to say, Abba, Father. So it's, it's a whole cycle of redemption in, in two verses of Scripture. But the Marian reference is significant. Uh, against any type of Gnostic or other type of Christological heresy, God the Son became man through Mary, and it was Mary's free cooperation that allowed Jesus to become man and to save us as the God-man, and that allows us to become adopted children, which also implies Mary's role as our spiritual mother. We go to the book of Revelation, Revelations 12, uh, 1. This is also a very pregnant passage uh, for many reasons. Let's take a step right, be, right, right back from 12.1 and go to Revelations 11.19. In Revelations 11.19, John sees a vision of the Ark of the Covenant in heaven, in the heavenly Jerusalem. Well, this is the Ark that's been lost for five centuries. And then God uh, reveals to John this vision that, well, there's the Ark, there it is. It's in heaven. That's, that's Revelations 11.19. The next scene, uh, remember, incidentally, that uh, you know, the gospel writers don't segregate their writings in chapter, in verse, uh, nor does anybody in the New Testament. That happens about the 14th 
uh, into the 15th century. So you have scene of the Ark of the Covenant, then you have the revelation of the woman clothed with the sun. And as good exegetes uh, explain and conclude, that's because the Ark is the woman. That's the new Ark of the Covenant, and then she shows herself as the woman clothed with the sun. So beautiful imagery and, and truth behind this revelation. She is a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and, and, our, and on her head a, a, a crown of 12 stars. Quick significance of each of these things. First of all, she clothed with the sun. The S, U, N, sun is always an image, an icon of the S, O, N, sun. And that, that bespeaks the intimacy between Mary and Jesus. Why the saints say, not theologically, but spiritually, you simply don't separate the two hearts. It's always the hearts of Jesus and Mary. St. John Huge would say, as the greatest uh, apostle and, and theologian of the two hearts say, it's even uh, appropriate to speak of them as one heart. The one heart of Jesus and Mary because their heart is so conformed one to the other. And so here, Mary is clothed with the sun, bespeaking that proximity to Jesus. The moon under her feet, the moon, as St. Bernard of Clairvaux says, the moon reflects the light of the sun without being its source or taking anything away from it. Just as Mary, as Mediatrix, reflects the light and the grace of Jesus without taking anything away from it, nor being the source. Mary does not do that. She's complete transparency. The stars, the 12 stars, signify, first of all, the 12 tribes of the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, uh, the 12 tribes of Jacob, and then in the New Testament, the 12 apostles. Old covenant, new covenant, Mary is the seal between the Old and New Covenant. We also have here the reality, and, and the question could be asked, well, how do we know this, this woman's Mary? Because the woman gives birth to the male child. Israel doesn't do that. The church doesn't do it uh, in a physical, uh, concrete sense. Mary does it. Mary alone does it. Now, does Revelation 12 also refer to the church in certain ways? Certainly it does. The woman refers to, to both Mary and the church, but as several of the fathers point out, the primacy has to be to Mary. Why? Because Mary alone gives birth to Jesus. Who's the child that will rule with the iron rod? He will be the ruler of all nations. Now, remember, and I, and I go quickly to uh, the Second Vatican Council, there were several theologians at the council that said, oh, no, don't call Mary mother of the church. She's only the daughter of the church. Uh, and blessed Paul VI rightly proclaimed her mother of the church. Why? Because if Mary doesn't say yes, we don't get Jesus. And because Mary is mother of God, she's also mother of the church. In that sense, she precedes the church by making the church possible by her yes in bringing us Jesus. And surely there's a mystery on how Mary is both mother and also the first disciple of the church, but you cannot take away the primacy of Mary, both theologically in reference to Jesus, and also in relation to the church, which was solemnly, which was proclaimed, excuse me, proclaimed by uh, Blessed Paul VI at the Second Vatican Council. She's mother of the church, and that's why in the first place Mary gives birth to Jesus. Beyond a general sense of Israel and beyond a general sense of the church, the person of Mary. Now we also see in Revelations 12 this battle that's going on. And is it not significant that Scripture has, as its bookends, a battle between the woman and the serpent? Genesis 3.15, Luke, excuse me, uh, Revelations 12, 1 and following. It's a battle between, between God's greatest creature and God's most heinous creature, a cosmic battle for souls. And that's why, you know, there's the reference of the battle in, in, in uh, Revelation 12, quote, for the rest of of her offspring, Satan's after the rest of her offspring, both then and now. This is a cosmic battle that doesn't stop. Uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola says, you can't deny that during our earthly life we are in a battle, whether we like it or not. It's a spiritual battle for souls. And that's why it's not insignificant and should be uh, underscored that Mary is leading the charge at the service of Jesus, never in competition, at the service of Jesus to get her children into grace with 
and through and mystically united with him, with Jesus. Satan doesn't like that, so he's going to be battling as not only as the serpent, but now as the great red dragon of the book of Revelations in this cosmic battle for souls. Finally, Revelations 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. That's kind of a, a closing part of the New Testament. The spirit is the Holy Spirit. The bride of the Holy Spirit is the church in general, but Mary in specific, because it's the spirit and the bride that come together for the incarnation. Once again, the primacy of the Marian text uh, should be appreciated. So again, survey of Mary in the New Testament, and we'll deal in greater detail with these beautiful texts regarding Our Lady as they come up uh, relative to the dogmas and doctrines. Thank you.